Yes. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go, I'm going to go here. I've just got some elements here. Now, again, here's my, what I said, I, I look for something on a white background, right? Yeah. So I'm going to select all of this, which I can go command all. And I'm going to go up here to edit. I'm going to make this black and white. I'm going to go up here to edit, define brush preset. And I'm going to go tombstone one and say, okay. And you can see what it did. It made a brush. Okay, so if I take this, and some of you might have done this before, but I'm, we're going to go a lot further with this, okay? It's not going to be just this. If I come in here now, that's what it's going to do. Tomorrow, we're going to go over, like, starting to really make these much more complicated, I think, tomorrow. But, so, also, if I come in here, once in a while, these actually make an interesting, like, if I, again, my favorite drawing brush in here is a feather they, they made, whoever made it made it out of a feather okay and then they probably tweaked it a little bit we'll talk about that tomorrow so what i'm going to do is go in here i'm going to go on a different layer and by the way what i see a lot again with entertainment students is they learn this technique now if you notice it doesn't go completely black right away okay now another thing i could probably do is go command Select that thumbnail and I get that. And I could probably go just with a white, um, probably even just fill it. Let's put it behind it. Okay, so I just filled the backer with white just so I could get a little more of that. Does that make sense? Okay. Wait, sorry, can you do that? Sorry, can you do that one more time? Sorry. Sure. So all I did was, there's my image, right? And you can see I can see through it a little bit. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Casey. Is that you talking, Casey? Yeah, that's me. Sorry. Okay, so I put a layer behind it and, and use that tombstone to make the selection, right? Yeah. And now I put a layer behind it, and I'm just going to fill it with white. Because what oh. that does is it opaques it. Okay, so oh, just okay. for now, I'm just gonna. And again, when I'm doing these demos, I'm doing quick. I'm doing them quickly, so just know that. And then I think it'd be a little more dynamic if it's doing that. And let's do. Now I could still go. Well, I actually wanted a little more silhouette-y, so I'm gonna go. Maybe there. I like that better. And then I'm gonna go here. Let's get rid of this. And I will go to this one. And again, I'm just going to go select all, edit, define crush preset, tombstone two, boom. Go back to my image, make a new layer. I'm going to put this guy more in the foreground. Oops, it's white. Let's flip it. Oops, I don't like that. I want this guy really dark. And again, I'm going to put this guy at an angle. I don't like it there. I'm going to try it over here. Let's just put it there. Good enough. Um, now, I'm thinking about how it overlaps, too. I don't want to have a tangency like that. You see that? Yeah? And it also gives me overlap, which is good. So I could go and put another one. I've got another one, but you guys get the point on that, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the thing where people fall apart on this. And this comes down to what I just said, where people like want to make things easy. Okay. So a lot of times, because I've, I've noticed this in other classes, they learn this technique and then they go, it's in a digital painting class usually. And then they go, Screw digital painting. I can put everything together like this. And it's like, okay, here's the problem with that. Number one, you're a slave to your reference then. Number two, if if I'm doing something stylistic, this isn't going to work because I'm not going to go out and be able to find the style of what I'm doing. So I have to create it anyway. 
But now what I might do is take elements that I've already created and create brush stamp stamp tools. And we're going to talk about a more in-depth thing that gets out of stamp tools where we can speed up our um, workflow process. But, um, you know, you've got to think about it stylistically. If I'm doing something like this or I'm just going, you know, there's an idea for something and it is realistic, this would be fine, you know, to have a discussion or whatever. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to go here and go... Let's try, let's try this one. I'm going to go command A for select all, edit, define brush preset, tree, one. Now you got a tree. Come on. Come in here, make a new layer. And I don't really need the whole tree, maybe. Let's make it a little small. Maybe I just want a little bit of that overhang. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's do one more. Select all, command all. Define brush preset, tree two. So now, Mike, yeah. Sorry, really quick question. So um, like with, with the source image to make this brush, it's slightly like um, like translucent in the middle. And so that transfers over, right? And that's how you're able to get the white peekaboo thing with the tombstone that you first did. Yeah, I'm just putting, a, it's, it's, I, it's a, I'm just backing it with white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all I'm trying to, all I'm doing with that is opaquing it. Yeah, that's it. Is that the, yeah. is that answer it? Yeah. So, well, I guess what I was asking is like the gray part of the original source image is like it's slightly translucent. So, yes. like anything that's straight up black, and you define it as like a brush that is like a hard, like solid, whatever color that you set your brush to. But if it's gray, it's kind of like a it little just for whatever reason, as you hit it multiple times, it gets more and more opaque. Okay. The reason I'm using the white backer is because I can knock it down to fairly dark. And then if you notice, I put the white backer on it, it sort of reveals some of the information in it. Okay. And I haven't found a way to just knock it in opaquely like that. You know, I should look in, yeah. I have looked into it, but I, you know, I tend to find solutions for these things. And in this class, I don't mind you guys looking for solutions. Like you guys are already doing it with a poster project. I'm going to put this here. Now, I could also go and maybe find a raven or something, and I could stick the raven in that tree, right? Yeah? Mm. And then again, okay, does all that make sense? Yes. And then again, I might then go, well, can I go back to, you're going to see I constantly reinforce tools that we already used. Can I go... Oops. Okay. Can I go here and go maybe a little bit of sepia in there? You know, I could do the, that's kind of cool. And then maybe I'll go up here. And again, I just throw down a color and then I adjust it. I wish I could do with regular painting, but huh. that's kind of nice. It's nice and desaturated. You know, that's too much, but I can pull it down. And then I could come in here and maybe go. Again, yeah, I'm doing this super half ass. Put another layer here. Maybe go back to here. Again, I just need a starting point.
And then again, I got to find it. That's too much. The red looks a little more ominous. Even that's kind of nice how subtle that is, right? Can you guys see that? <sighs> yes. I never know like what your screens are seeing. So that's soft light. I kind of like that. Kind of like that. Now, if I go, let's see if we can do this. If I go, well, that's a little too red. I should be able to come in here and like I can desaturate it a little bit and get a little more subtle effect like that. Or I could shift it through the color spectrum again. Now, one thing I do sometimes, I don't know if I would do it here, but sometimes I, I like to vary the, um, the light because that just makes it look more believable. And this light, by the way, is already sort of uh, varied. So the, the overlay sort of did that for me already, but I'm just gonna say a lot of times what I do is I'll pick whatever this is. I'm gonna get this hot spot right here. And what I'll do is I'll go you know, I'll just hit a couple of spots And why do I do that? To better define the light source coming through the curtains. Yeah. So what happens when you look at a light, what a lot of people do is they diffuse the whole window with one sort of value and color and all that. And if you look at lighting through a window now here, I like it. That's not too bad. Actually like that. What really happens with like, if you look at an office building, you don't see, and this is how people always paint it. They'll have the big bank of windows and they're all sort of bluish, greenish, whatever they are, right? And you're like, that's not how it works. Number one, through the building, you'll see a temperature shift, okay? So it might be this floor probably has fluorescent lighting. This floor has this kind of light, who knows, right? And then you'll get hot spots because somebody might have a, a lamp near their, on their desk near the window. So now I get a hot spot and I might get a hot spot because maybe the lights are up in the ceiling and I get a little bit of a hot spot. So the light sort of, you can get little hot spots. If you're driving past somebody's house at night and they got the windows low and the TV on, you see that weird bluish flickering going on, right? And if TV's close to the windows, then you get that. Look. So all I'm trying to do is just go, is vary the lighting so it feels a little more believable, right? Which just means I'm probably gonna have a few hot spots, okay? Not always, but you know, you can see it sort of makes it a little more believable. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's the tung tungsten lighting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It could be tungsten lighting, can be sodium vapor lighting, can be fluorescent lighting, can be amber lighting, can be incandescent lighting. Incandescent lighting is super yellow. Um, sodium vapor is like a weird um, ambery, uh, super uh, unnatural ambery color. Okay. Um, yeah. There used to be, I don't know if I ever said this, but there, uh, I worked for this huge company for a while. My, you know, it's like any other company has huge building uh, and the, most of the building was all the industrial part of the operation. Right. And then we're in the bank of offices and offices in the front. And I had my office opened up out into the, like the warehouse and all that stuff. And I liked that because I could escape all the time. But anyway, when you went out there, I actually thought this was, shouldn't be allowed. They had sodium vapor lighting in there. And I'm like, I can't believe people have to stand in this horrible lighting all day long. It looks like you're in some kind of weird dream. And it's like, it's really not healthy. Okay. And Isn't also, like the, if you go to down, lights? go ahead. Isn't that like the night lights? Like what they, use, like, they use them a lot in industrial situations and in big giant warehouses and stuff like that. For whatever reason. I don't know why. It's just industrial lighting. But also if you go to LA. Like I go to my friend's gallery and he has a gallery downtown near Fitham, like in the fashion area. And if you come out of there at night, for whatever reason, I don't know if this is all over LA, I can't remember, but in that area, at least they use, I think it's sodium vapor lighting and it's, it's that weird unnatural color. So it gives the street like this weird surreality at night. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's mostly that particular area. Other districts will have a different lamp. A I have different no idea. Bowl. Yeah. But um, anyway, it, it's just, again, mood, right? Like I'd argue, you know, if you're under sodium vapor lighting, you come out of this, because I've done this a million times. I come out of the opening, walk out on the street. And I'm like, what? it's like a weird, it's, it's off-putting. You know what I mean?
And there's somebody, by the way, I have a picture of this. One night we're, we came out of the opening, me and a friend of mine, we walk across the street, I turn around and there's somebody in a cloak, right? I'm not kidding you, it looked like death or something, right? Like walking down the street and because of that lighting and everything, and plus it was just so weird, I was like, I was tripping out on it, right? And then my friend goes, because it was so weird looking, my friend goes, did you just see that? Like she was, wasn't sure if she saw it either. Right. And I, and I got a picture of it because I go, oh, when I take a picture of it, it'll just look normal or something, you know, it'll, it, but it didn't. It looks super weird. And somebody else has told me they've seen that person. So I don't know what that's all about. But you still have that picture? Yeah, I have it somewhere. Right on. Uh, I, I actually want to find it. It's a creepy. It's weird. I mean, you see all kinds of shit like that down in L.A. Now, I'd prob- I like that there's just one light on here, but then I'd have to go over here and light up these two because it looks like they're on the same room. Right. And, you know, and I get a quick image, okay? Now, to me, what these things are really good for, I mean, it could be good for a lot of things. could be good for a quick discussion. Hey, I'm thinking something like this. You only spend 15 minutes on it. <coughs> if I'm talking to another creative person and they're really creative and really understanding of imagery and all that sort of stuff, I'm maybe this is going to be stylized, but I go, hey, man, it'll have something like this vibe, except I'm going to stylize it like we talked about with this or we've been working on or like this sketch, but I'm going to sort of light it like this and do this kind of color thing with it. And if it's somebody who knows what they're doing, they'll be like, oh, all right, I get it, you know, and then, you know, and then I might go, OK, so everybody's digging that. So maybe I'll take my drawing now. I'll block it out real quick and then I'll apply this lighting to it and this idea to it. Does that make sense? Maybe I'll take my own tree and, you know, whatever. It, well, if I have my own tree and I don't need a stamp. So does that make sense? Yes. So it's pretty straightforward. Just always weird to me why people, I think this is a useful tool in context, but other than that, it's not. Hang on. Okay, let me get a screen grab here. And then what we're going to start, I think I have to look at my notes, but I think what we're going to start tomorrow is to start to take this further into, hang on. Here it is. I gave you all these um, images. If you want to use different images, I don't care. Hang on, sorry. Um, any questions on this? No, I think this is pretty straightforward. Yeah, I do too. Uh, so go ahead. For, for just to clarify, for tomorrow's, um, this is an exercise. So for tomorrow, we're going to be basically doing the same kind of mock-up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, you can use different images if you want. I don't care. Okay. Cool. But what? And you got to make this easier on yourself. Uh, it's way easier if you go find. Um, uh, oh, by the way, let's look at this real quick. So when I created these, I'm going to go to my brushes, oops, right here. And here's the ones I just created. You see them? So if I was working on this project, I might just go And now they're in this folder and they're the current tools I'm using that I've created for this particular job. Okay. And we'll talk about it later. You could take these and I could export these and they'll exp export to an ABR file dot ABR file, I think it's called. And, um, and then I can double click that file and it'll just reload all these back into Illust Photoshop. So I don't need to keep them all the time. I can keep a folder for all these specialty brushes. I might have some in here. Yeah. Right here. So I, I'm, and I've created different ones. Let me see, where is it? Yeah, here. I've created different ones for different things. You know, I've got hanging vines. I've got things growing up. Just depends on what I'm doing, right? This one is for, <clears throat> I did a pencil drawing of a, a Japanese temple and then I was pulling foliage sort of from that 
idea. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I can mix these up. I can go grab that, take it down here, edit, flip it here, maybe go to my warp. No, I'm on the wrong layer. Hang on. Now go to my warp. You know, and just change it enough where it's not repeating. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also, when I take this and I bring it down here like that, you're not really going to notice it as much because then I'm creating a, um, a little, you know, shrub idea. And then as we get further into other types of brushes, there's a lot of different ways to do this. That's that's repeating a little too much. So maybe it comes down here. Maybe I just simply take it and do that. And I can start to create these different things. And after a while, you know, you, you have like a little library. What I would try and do though, and like I've said, it used to be really hard to organize your brushes in Illustrator or in Photoshop. It's much easier now. You just do that. You make a, uh, a folder and throw it in there, right? Now I keep, and I've got some in here, I think I have duplicated because I've done them as demos or whatever, but um, right here, you know, I try and keep them in the order I use them. My favorites is just literally that. Here's my favorite drawing brush, some uh, brush tools I like. Then usually I go to smudge. Here's all my smudge tools. This isn't a smudge tool. I don't know why that's in there. Um, you know, then I like these inking brushes. Those are nice. Uh, my grub brushes, my oil brushes, and then I think I have one that's impasto brushes in here somewhere. So I don't smudge. The reason these are duplicated is, see, this is this whole file was part of another file. So that's actually not very um, organized. Dry media brushes. I think those are um, native Photoshop brushes. I don't know why I have a smudge two here. That's the same thing as that one. I got to organize these. Special effects brushes. This comes in handy. This one here. Let's go to a lighter value. You know, I might tweak this brush and I could probably make a little um, star brush out of it, star pattern brush out of it. We'll start talking about adjusting them tomorrow. Here's a wider one. Let's go really light in value here. And let's go. So what I could do, let's do this. I could have that back there and just kind of hit a few here and it gives them that nice little, and then I can go take my eraser and I wouldn't have them in front of the tree, obviously. I'm gonna go to my eraser I think I can go all the way up on this. And I might just go, anything that's sticking out a little bit too much to me, I might knock it out. So I don't want to have too much. The trick with stars is you have stars that are far away and then you have stars that are closer, I'm assuming. And if you ever notice, some ones are, are brighter than the other ones and that's what gives the, the sky like that depth, okay? So I like to have a few popping out. Sometimes I literally go in if I'm creating it myself and I might go in on a few with a regular brush and just go bing and put a little highlight just in a few of them. Right. And it'll start to sparkle a little bit. Okay. So I, and I'm going to show you guys a real simple um, way to do sort of a planet scene um, again, using brushes and um, which we're going to uh, probably do like Wednesday or something. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, everything I'm showing you, you don't have to be an illustrator or whatever, but you see how much depth that gave the sky right there. Right. Um, you know, and then I could also vary all this. I could, I don't know. I could warm it up down here a little bit if I wanted so on and so forth. Right. I could go in here maybe and go, let's try this. Let's do this. 
Let's see if I can find a brush. It's sort of a not good brush normally. Let's go down here. So I actually want something that's sort of ribbony. Maybe that'll work. So let's go, let's do this. Let's go here, come on. So I wanna get a little more of a purpley thing. Again, I can readjust it, it's fine. And I'm gonna put this, yeah, it's fine. It's gonna be really half-assed, but. I could dial this up and down. I haven't quite quite the ribbony effect I want yet. Sort of there. Let's try a different one. I'm gonna try this one. And I think it has to be this one. But I could dial this up and down if I had a nice ribbony brush. And I could start to get an Aurora Borealis kind of thing going on. Does that make sense? Yeah? Oops. Yes. Hang on. I don't have enough sky to really pull it off here. Because it'll blur at the top and the bottom. That's just kind of cool right there. So on and so forth, right? So if I get a ribbony effect and I sort of blur the top and the bottom, it'll get that Aurora Borealis thing. I don't, again, I don't have enough sky for it. Okay, questions on any of this? No, this is pretty straightforward. Thank okay. you, Mike. Um, I'm gonna edit the video as quick as I can. I'm still having problems with my thing for some reason, but um, which I don't understand. Uh, I'll probably edit this to just this discussion around the tools. Is that fine? These other stuff was just discussion. I think that's, I, you know, it's fine. Um, so I'll just try and edit it to that part. Okay. The informational part. Um, I want to get this done by tomorrow. Okay. Uh, it's really, it's pretty simple. Okay. But it's, it's going to set us up to start doing what we're going to start doing tomorrow which is getting much more into reactive brushes, directional brushes, how you're adjusting these brushes. Um, this tool is really cool. You can make some cool drawing brushes and things like that, like the one I told you, but you got to learn how to take this way further, okay, for it to really be effective and to go in and start understanding how you're adjusting all these brushes, um, especially if you're an illustrator, especially if you're an entertainment design person. But I'd argue, again, it's image making. Does that make sense? Anybody's creating images, you got to know this stuff, okay? And graphic designers will probably use it in different ways and all that kind of stuff. And But this is a good, it's not just a workflow thing here, by the way. Now we're getting into, once we start getting into more uh, advanced ideas about brushes, it's really going to become more about adjusting those things to, to make yourself comfortable, especially with painting and things like that, where you, it's really important to me that I have brushes I feel feel good, just like in the real world. Does that make sense? So, you know, we want to do that here. And I'd argue, I don't always want, I, sometimes I need to dial a brush in myself, not just go, uh, you know, I need to make one myself, not just go find one all the time. Does that make sense? Did I give you guys my brushes yet? You gave us your smudge um, brushes. Okay, I'll probably give you my brushes and then we'll start talking about that tomorrow. Um, basically, you, okay, so here's the thing, the group brushes or whatever the hell they're called. I don't know why, but they load individually. So they'll load a brush. And, and so what I always do is I load the brush. It puts it in its own folder. I create a folder. I call it whatever, group brushes or whatever. And then I just drag them in there because I get students that go, oh, pain in the ass. Like, okay, you want me to not give you brushes? I'm sorry. I didn't design them. You know what I mean? It's like, really? It's going to take a half an hour to do this, really? And then you're going to have like 350 really good brushes to choose from. So don't piss and moan about it. It's annoying to me. Um, 
you're, I just, they, it, for some reason it does that. I don't know why it should usually the load is a whole group. Okay. So I'll probably give, um, I'll give you, um, I got to pare these down because I got so many brushes and in different groups that I got to, I think the first one I give you has all my group brushes and some oil brushes and impasto brushes, I think. Then I have red Greg Rakowski brushes. By the way, the Greg Rakowski brushes also has two videos in it of him doing a painting from beginning to end. Okay. And the guy's a monster painter. He's the guy who did this thing. Oh, not that one. The dragon one. You know that dragon one I showed you guys? Um, really, I mean, some of his stuff is really hard to tell. It's not an oil painting. Um, anyway, and it's just, you'll see it's really simple. He just starts with big silhouettes and starts working in the silhouettes. It's pretty straightforward. There's no bullshit with him. He's just painting, which I like. Okay. Uh, and then his brushes are in there. Um, and then I'll give you my ink brushes. I didn't, did I give you my rusty nib brushes? I don't recall seeing your. Okay, so I'll put nib. those in there. That has um, literally that. It's these. Look. Yeah. So let's look at a couple of things real quick. See if I can find the video real quick. Come on, where are you? Sorry, my brush. All right, here we go. So here, that's these. This is the rusty nib ones. We don't really need the music. Nice inky brushes. Yeah. Okay, but this also is the one that comes with those watercolor uh, brushes I was using. Remember when we were talking about that? Yeah, so it has like an 80% watercolor wash. They're really nice brushes. Um, hang on. But they also have all these ink brushes in there. Okay, the other ones are these. I just like to show you what they do. So the other ones are sort of more reactive brushes, okay? Um, and then I got some in there that are impasto, some are oil, blah, 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 okay? Um, look at that texture. Um, now, again, it's going to become right tool for the right job. What's really nice about this, and by the way, I used to use a program, I'm gonna, I might get it again, I used to use a program called Art Rage. Have you guys ever heard of that? Uh, years ago, right? And and I don't. I still haven't seen any brushes that emulate what that program did. So what I used to do is I would build my whole painting in Photoshop. Then at the very end, I take it into Art Rage and I throw those big fat oil impasto strokes all over it. And I just haven't seen brushes that do it as good as that program yet. Have you Have you tried it, Casey? Yeah, I loved Art Rage. That was like literally like 2008 like 2009 yeah, yeah, yeah. and like the acrylic brushes like you could see like the the texture yeah. of like the paintbrush and it was and you could legit. do really fat impasto yeah. strokes in it it was a really it's still it's around fun. i just looked it up because i go to that oh. and it's still around right but i'm not understanding why it's not more popular than it is i really think it's because most of the painters right now are digital painters and they don't even understand any of that stuff like, you know, and it, I, I don't know how much it really matters if you don't know how to paint, really. I, you know what I mean? It, you got to know how to use that stuff. You're building up, you're building your painting, by the way, digitally. It's what we were talking about in the plain air thing. It's like you're coming in really washy and loose and, and transparent, even with oil, right? And then you're building up fatter and fatter paint. And that's kind of, that's the same thing I do digitally, okay? I, or a lot of people do. Greg Wachowski, all that. It's not like I invented it, right? Does that make sense? All right, you guys, uh, I think I got my, what do you call it? I got my, um, okay, so now we're getting out of selection so much into, so, I don't know, some, I think it's fun stuff now. Yeah, okay. Um, that's it, I think. Where are we at? No, not too bad, 1230. Um, I'm gonna go eat breakfast. 
All right, you guys, I'll see you tomorrow, yeah? Thank you, Mike. See you Good tomorrow. Job, you guys. Bye. Enjoy your breakfast.